Hi all, thank you for joining today's career panel where we're going to discover and look into careers in medical affairs. I'm Kristen Boskin, Executive Director of the Georgia Bioed Institute, which is the workforce division of the Center for Global Health Innovation. We like to call that CGHI for short because it is a mouthful. But essentially we cover the whole range of workforce for the life sciences from research um, and development to pharmaceuticals, to medical device, and uh, healthcare and public health, especially with the CDC and the Task Force for Global Health having such a large presence in Georgia. So we're so excited to be here today to talk about the various careers within medical affairs, and we have an amazing moderator from UCB, Ms. Yvonne Mobley. And Yvonne has a great background and really grateful for what she has uh, is bringing herself and then also leveraging her network of other medical affairs professionals uh, to discuss just the different ways and nooks and crannies within the medical affairs community. Yvonne has a really neat uh, background. So she has her BA in ecology and evolutionary biology. And then she spent some time getting a sprinkling of experience within the academic science space from teaching seventh grade science with Teach for America, uh, then increasing her own research skills through a post-baccalaureate research education program at Duke, where she did some intense research and journaling, and then moved on to being an adjunct instructor at Elon University, where not only did she teach, but she created the course in immunity and infectious disease. Then she went on to go to Duke University and get her PhD in molecular genetics and microbiology. And she did a postdoc fellowship in clinical immunology. That created a great foundation for her where she then stepped into industry, first with Assurix Health as a medical science liaison, and then moved on to UCB where she was a medical affairs manager, and she now is the medical field lead at UCB. So Yvonne, thank you again so much for joining us and pulling together this great group of industry professionals. And I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thank you, Kristen, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. Sometimes I hear myself being introduced, I'm like, oh wow, yes, I did do that. Oh, I remember that, that was fun. So yes, yeah, so thank you for that. And also, I'm super excited as well to be joined by two wonderful panelists who I know personally and know very well. And so I'm excited that they have joined us um, just to give you all just a bit more information about myself. So I, as Kristen said, have my PhD in molecular genetics and microbiology, and I'm working with our medical affairs team here at UCB. And I know a lot of times people sometimes ask, well, what is medical affairs? What do you all do? So there's a lot of different arms to medical affairs, but in particular, the arm that I am in, I like to kind of tell people that we help educate the clinicians about the medications that the company creates. And so we're the people that go in and kind of talk with a lot of the doctors, the nurses, and everything like that to make sure they have the information they need so that they can help the patients get on the medication that will hopefully help them out as well. So I like to think of ourselves as somewhat like the individuals that help continue to educate the clinicians about the medications and the drugs that our company produces. More specifically, my company right now, I'm focused in the neurology department. So I work with our epilepsy team. And so we're focused on the epilepsy medications that UCB does have. And so with that, I definitely want to give my other two very esteemed panelists a chance to introduce themselves as well. And so we will start off with you, Shreya. If you could tell us about your company, tell us a bit about your background, that would be great. Thank you, Yvonne. Um... Uh, thank you guys for inviting me here today. Sorry about the background noise. I have a two-year-old, so it's a little hectic back here. Um, so I graduated from Rutgers. I have a bachelor's in psych. Um, went on to do some uh, biomedical uh, work um, in the master's program at UMDNJ, and then decided to go to med school. Um, and uh, graduated, worked in medicine for a little bit, but. Um, I went back to research. One of the main reasons was because of my family. So um, it just, you know, time. 
um, and to have more time with them. So uh, I got into, I started working at a small CRO. That's where I started, where I wore many hats. So got a taste of, you know, regulatory medical writing. Um, and that's where, you know, medical affairs uh, being that liaison, um, you know, it just interested me. And so I then applied to Zimmer Biomet, which is a global medical device company. Um, and uh, I became, uh, you know, a manager there and uh, have just, you know, loved working in this field. And, you know, the, bi the biggest thing um, about, I would say, Zimmer Biomet is just the work-life balance. So I'm super excited to uh, talk about them. Wonderful. Thank you, Sharia. And Sharia and I have known each other for a few years, and so it's been great to continue to see you go through the journey and talk through some of the things that we both experienced in the medical affairs field. And with that, now I'll pass it over to you, Laura, for an introduction and tell us a bit about your company and yourself. Thanks, Yvonne. So my background is a little bit similar to Shreya as well. I have an undergrad degree in exercise physiology. And from there, I also did some biomedical science work. I have my master's in biomedical science. And then I went to medical school at Ross University. And while I was studying for my boards, I started doing clinical trials and what is typically called sponsor initiated clinical trials, meaning that the pharmaceutical companies are sponsoring the clinical studies. I worked with two other physicians at the site and we were seeing tons of patients in all different types of disease states in psychiatry in women's health in infectious disease, hepatology. So we did a lot of different disease states. I loved it there, but I got a little burned out. And from there, I was able to make the transition over to the actual pharma side. And first, I started off as a clinical trial liaison, which has some parallels to a medical science liaison, except that you're working only with the clinical trials that are ongoing. And then from there, transitioned over to the medical science liaison with AssureX Health. And now I am a senior medical science liaison at Biogen in our Alzheimer's division for their global medical affairs side. And I love it. Same with Shreya. I have a lot of freedom and flexibility, and I really enjoy getting to still make impact on patients' lives by educating providers on the newest medications that are coming to market. Great, and thank you, Laura. And Laura, I would like to believe that I've had a major hand in helping you in terms of getting into the medical affairs field since, yes, back in the day, I did hire you on as a medical science liaison on my team. So glad to see that you're still doing well. <laughs> yes. So one of the things I definitely wanted to talk about is in general, like what does, you know, a typical day kind of look like for each of you? I know being in the field myself, a lot of times people ask me, oh, well, what does a typical day look like? And typically I'm just like, it changes every single day. No two days are the same. But if you all could just give a bit more information about what it is that you do on more of that day-to-day -day basis. And then even, I know you both just spoke about really having a bit more of that work-life balance and just talk about how some of what your day-to-day -day gives you that flexibility in regards to work-life balance. We can start with you, Laura. Sure. So definitely, you're absolutely right, Yvonne, that there is no typical day when you are an MSL, which is absolutely one of the things I love. Again, that flexibility. However, every week we have main goals. So our goal every week is to talk to what you might call a KOL, a key opinion leader, which are HCPs, healthcare providers that are normally at larger institutions that really are well respected in their field. At my company, we call them KMEs, key medical experts. We also meet with HCPs that are more on a community basis. We can also meet with PAs, nurse practitioners. So we really interact with all different types of healthcare providers. Typically here at Biogen, Mondays are our national meeting days for all the MSLs on the Alzheimer's disease team. So we Mondays are pretty packed with meetings. That day is not as 
flexible. However, the rest of the week, I'm in the field meeting with my KMEs, my HCPs. And what makes it really flexible is that I create my own schedule. So I choose when I want to be in the field, what days that I'm going to be at home doing admin work. And that is one of the other pieces to being an MSL that some people may not enjoy as much, <laughs> but it's an important part because you also need to show what you've been out there working so hard doing. So typically every day, you know, I'll start by checking my emails, seeing what is going on, if we've had any new updates, especially anything new from what we call our medical information team, which are really the ones who put together information for us to be able to relay out in the field. So we always wanna make sure that we are up to date on the newest information that we can share. And then, you know, it just really depends on the day, what type of meetings I have. I might have some virtual meetings, especially in the world that we're in right now. I might go out to meet a physician at lunch. I can also do dinner presentations. So it really does change on a day-to-day -day basis, but overall the goals are similar every week for what I'm trying to obtain. And then, like I said, then typically on Fridays, I really like to be, make sure I'm home so I'm completing my admin work where we are what's called logging the interactions. And the interaction is just what it sounds like where you are talking about what happened happen between the meeting with yourself and the providers that you met with that week. And that's really important because what you're trying to do is give the feedback that we call vocals. It's very typical to call it vocals um, back to the company to let them know, you know, what are these providers saying about this new med medication? What are you out there teaching these providers about. So that's really a very surface level, but really, you know, important things that we're our main goals as an MSL. There's also side projects we may be working on. For me, one of my pet projects is I actually run a working group for research and development, and I am currently launching a study, helping launch a study that is going to start any day now. We actually have had our first site initiation visits, so I lead that group, and that's another important part as an MSL. While you have your main task of connecting with the providers in your territory, you also will be working on different side projects that is really helping the company grow. And it's one of the things I really enjoy as an MSL as well, because you gives you a chance to dabble in some areas outside of your normal everyday activities. Great. Thank you for that, Laura. And I definitely agree with you. I think that one of the things, especially being an MSL, like you said, having that flexibility with your schedule, you know, deciding on a daily basis if you want to travel, if you don't want to travel. And that is one thing I definitely want to highlight from my experience, though, is that MSL role required quite a bit of travel. It was the type of position where, you know, week to week, I would be out in the field, you know, for my territory, I was up in the Northeast. So kind of covered everything from like Virginia all the way up through Maine. So it kind of depended on what appointments I had, where I needed to be, if I spent the night in a hotel and things like that. It actually was funny because once we went into the pandemic, it took only about three weeks before I realized I hadn't slept in my own bed for that many consecutive nights in quite some time. So it does require quite a bit of travel. So that is one thing that I personally have really enjoyed because I've gotten to be able to see a lot of different places and even still allowed me to connect with some friends and meet new friends and things like that along the way as well. And so, Shreya, for you, so how would you kind of describe what it is that you do on a day-to-day -day basis or week-to-week -week basis and how you've been able to really utilize that to have the work-life balance that you spoke highly about? So um, with me, I so I didn't start off as a medical science liaison. Um, and so when I started with Zimmer, it was a um, associate manager for medical um, affairs. And mainly on, for a day-to-day, -day, it was answering uh, physicians calls and emails um, with off-label uh, questions that they had about our products. So, you know, how much of, you know, an antibiotic can you mix with, you know, your product, for example. So I spent most of the time doing that. And um, also when there were times where, let's say, marketing or regulatory had to meet with a physician, um, they would also pull in, you know, medical affairs just to field questions um, if there were any, uh, you know, off-label questions. 
so that was um, what I did. And, and mainly, again, it's it as long as we answered the question within, I mean, my boss liked to do it in like 12 hours. Um, as long as you answered the questions, you were fine. Um, I also did a lot of reading on our products just to make sure that we are up to date with all of the literature, you know, um, and be able to speak to it intelligently when asked questions. So that's that was my typical day to day. <laughs> so Great. I mean, it. Like, oh, I no, go start ahead. It. Sorry, so I could start at 7 a.m., you know, if I wanted to and, and be done by early afternoon. So. Exactly. And as you said, I do think that one of the big components about being in medical affairs is really having that flexibility. And even more recently with a lot of individuals talking about, you know, working from home and being able to be remote. I was like, well, I've been remote and I haven't had to go in and report into an actual office and do more of like the traditional nine to five or anything like that for some time because I've been in medical affairs and it has given me that flexibility where, you know, if there's a day where I need to run to the doctors or even in the middle of the day, if I decide I want to stop by the grocery store, like there's nothing thing that's kind of inhibiting me from being able to do those things and really being able to have that flexibility to my day. Exactly. And now another thing, we all definitely have our own journey. Just wanted to know if there's anything in particular that you feel either in your educational, your professional, your personal journey that has helped steer you into the career that you're in now. And if so, what was that and how do you think it helped to affect your decision to be where you're at now? So I started um, in under in un, like I would say grad school. Uh, I was uh, in research at the VA um, in the neuroscience uh, department, and I think that's where I was very interested. And at the time, I'd already applied to medical school, so um, you know, just getting that background in medicine, and then also being able to um, be able to go into research, you know, with that background, I think it just, I don't know, it just made sense for me. So, and, and again, you have that flexibility now, of course, I'm not saying I'm going to go back into practice tomorrow, but you know, you have that option if you want to. So I feel like that's what led me to uh, go into research. I feel like. Yeah. I'll say for myself, it was working the clinical trials with which were sponsor initiated, which really opened the door to industry for me because I had never thought about it until then. And really seeing, you know, that you're still making an impact on patients and their lives and their families just from a different perspective um, opened up my eyes to industry and made me take a deeper look. And it was funny when I started to get burned out doing the clinical trials because with the clinical trials, you have a very set schedule and you're at the clinic all day. And some days I was there till midnight, even it just, it just depended on the day. Unlike this, where <laughs> it's a much easier lifestyle, but it was funny because the internal medicine physician that I worked with there, Dr. Johnson is actually the one who even told me what a medical science liaison was. It was something that I had never even heard of. And I think a lot of providers out there have not really heard um, what a medical science liaison was. And she discussed with me how she really enjoyed meeting with the MSLs when she was practicing in her own private practice and learning and, you know, discussing and get educated um, on the different things that are coming out and her and I kind of talked about it and I was like wow I think that's something I would really be interested in but already having that background of going to these investigator meetings so I already had some foundation for understanding how the pharmaceutical companies worked, what a CRO was that really helped me be able to make that transition over into the industry side. Yes, great, Laura. And similar to you, I as well had no clue about medical affairs or even what a medical science liaison was. For me, my introduction to it was when a recruiter sent me a message on LinkedIn and was just like, hey, I was looking at your profile. I think this may be a position that you're interested in. And from there, I started doing a bit more background research, looking into what a medical science liaison does. And I felt like it fit with my personality. So if I go back quite a bit, going into undergrad, I originally was on the pre-med track, was planning on going to medical school, had done all of the pre-med requisites, 
even had taken the MCAT and everything and was working on completing my application. And that was the time when I really had that moment of like self-reflection. Because for me, I'd grown up in a low income single parent home where a lot of times people were saying, well, you're really good at science. You should go and be a doctor. But I hadn't really been exposed to very many other things. And so from there, I really just realized, you know, I've been saying that I wanted to do this mainly because other people have been telling me this is something I should do. But it wasn't necessarily something that I truly felt like I wanted to do. And so I did take that time and I went and I taught seventh grade science. And at that point, I realized I had this love for helping to educate others. And so I was like, okay, well, how can I still, you know, remain in the sciences, but use the passion that I have for education to move forward into a, a different career? And so that's when I looked into getting my PhD because that, yes, I was doing research, but I felt like that gave me more of that window into being able to be what I originally thought I was going to do was a college professor and teaching college. And then once I went into a different laboratory, a clinical lab, and that's where I had a bit more of the kind of real world experience of what labs do when patients send in their blood samples and how those things happen in the background and was working with clinicians and talking with them about the results that they were getting. I felt like I was still helping to do a lot of that education, but of a different type of space and in a different space. And so when the medical science liaison role was presented to me, I felt like that still fit because it allowed me to educate clinicians instead of, you know, seventh graders, which isn't that much fun, no offense to any seventh graders, but educating seventh graders or educating college students, I was then working to basically educate and kind of make sure that the clinicians knew a lot of information because they have so many different medications that they have to stay up to date on that it's difficult for them to do that. So I felt like I was really helping them to make sure that they were providing the best service to their patients. And now thinking about still that journey and kind of what the two of you have been through, just do you feel like there's any specific advice or anything that you would suggest to individuals that are looking to get into the medical affairs field? And if so, please share that. And even if there's anything that you feel are some typical stumbling blocks that individuals may encounter and what your advice would be in terms of them kind of getting over any of those hurdles that they may encounter and getting into a career in medical affairs. I would try and do um, an internship if possible. Um, I feel like that will really, you know, kind of tell you whether you're interested or whether, you know, you even want to do this. So I would look for companies and I know like Abbott and Abby, they have internship, you know, roles. So I would really, um, my advice would be if you're thinking this and you're, you know, in school, um, I would try and do an internship to see whether this is what you really want to do. Yes, I totally agree. I think the other advice I would give is that if you're interested in being a medical science liaison, it's very hard to get those positions. A lot of times they really want you to have experience. I was lucky enough that Yvonne, they took me without, without MSL experience, but there's other avenues. So don't be afraid to maybe start off in medical information. I know we've had plenty of med info people come go over and become MSLs. There's other ways to get your foot into the door and will give you that experience and somebody will give you the opportunity to be the MSL, but it's very hard to obtain these positions a lot of time without any previous experience. So don't get discouraged. Think about different avenues and different ways you can be a part of the pharmaceutical industry. There's research and development. There's a lot of different divisions out there, not just the, um, the medical affairs, but that do work closely with the medical affairs side. Totally agree. Yes, I know, Sherry, you definitely spoke about internships. Does your company offer any internships? And kind of similar question for you, Laura, do you know of any specific internships with your company? Um, Zimmer does. They don't have a medical affairs uh, internship, but um, they do offer internships in like regulatory, um, you know, clinical affairs and such. 
Uh, Biogen does not have internships in medical affairs, but same, they have a lot of different internships throughout. Biogen's a very large company, and it's actually broken in between global and U.S., and even though I'm U.S.-based, I'm actually considered global, so it's a little bit different, but they definitely have opportunities, and even interesting enough within our company, they allow you to internship. So if you were in, in a different department and you were really interested in being in an MSL, once a year, they do provide opportunities for crossover where you can go and internship within the own your own company, which is very interesting and unique to allow you to get some exposure some, to some different areas of the company. Yes, definitely. I think that a lot of that is just that general experience and exposure to industry, because once you're in and you're able to kind of learn some of the ins and outs of what industry is, to be able to understand some of even just the vocabulary that we use and things like that, that that gives you a bit of a leg up on some of the other individuals that may be applying for some of those positions that even may have experience. And one thing I wanted to discuss was in regards to medical affairs, people can definitely come in with a wide range of backgrounds. Yes, typically for the medical affairs roles, it does normally require a doctorate degree. So a lot of times we see individuals that are coming in with their PhDs, which is what I have, MD, which is what our other two panelists have, but then also a PharmD. So pharmacists will apply for these positions as well. But there are even some companies and a lot of times where I've even considered a lot of times with individuals that don't have that doctor degree, either there are nurse practitioners that have had a wide range of clinical experience that we feel could be really valuable to the team. So definitely don't think that, you know, it's a one size fits all. There's always some opportunities in that flexibility and availability if you're able to really kind of get your foot in the door as well. And I know another thing that I do see happen quite often with medical affairs, and it's not something that's for everyone, but some people will go in and work in sales in the pharmaceutical industry first. And then once they've once again gotten in, networked with individuals, they will then try and transition over into a medical affairs role once they've been in the sales side, which actually does sometimes give a bit more of a foundation within that space where you've started to develop relationships with some of the clinicians in your area and you have some of those interactions that are somewhat similar to what our medical science liaisons or individuals in medical affairs can have. Absolutely. In fact, my current field director is a nurse practitioner herself. And the reason she got into it is she was working in the MS space for a very long time in Johns Hopkins. And and then she was able to make the transition to an MS MSL and now is the field director this year for us. So it can happen. Absolutely. And um, Yvonne and I also know another um, person who is a farm D who started on sales and now she is a senior MSL with a new company and she's doing just great. And yeah, so there's definitely more than one ways to enter this industry. Great. And so another thing I wanted to talk about, because this we hit on this a bit with those internships and really being able to get into the industry and starting to learn more about it. But another thing that we hear a lot about is networking. So what do you all think about networking? How important do you think it is and any advice that you may give individuals in regards to networking? Oh, network away. Meet as many people as you can, Um, you know, foster those relationships. Uh, because it's it's sometimes unfortunately all about you know who you know and and honestly sometimes they just become you know really good friends so I would say network away. A- absolutely, do not be afraid to network and do not be afraid to ask for that help because it is a very small world and you never know when that person will turn around and need your help. Um, Don't be afraid to reach out to people on LinkedIn. Also, that was one of the things that I really was able to do when I was transitioning is, you know, making people these connections on LinkedIn. And there's also a lot of recruiters in this space and making connections with them as well is very helpful because they'll be very honest with you about, you know, what you should apply for, what you shouldn't. And when, if they feel you're right for a position, they'll definitely help you get that, those opportunities. And, you know, it's funny where I am now, there's several employees from the previous company. And now some of us are spreading out from here. So 
those connections will carry on because you never know where somebody will end up. Yes, and I would definitely agree with all of that. Networking is very important. And one of the things that I would even suggest for individuals to do is based on whatever scientific field that you're interested in, also look into seeing what conferences are available in that space. Because that's a lot of times where you will have a lot of the key industry individuals that will be there. They have booths. It's very easy for you to walk up to talk with them and things like that. I mean, and it's also useful for you to be able to get to know some of the science that's going on in that area, go around, look at the posters and see what type of research individuals are doing. But I think that looking into conferences that may be in the space that you're interested in is also a very good resource where you can go, you can attend those conferences. And a lot of times they can be rather expensive, but if you really look into it, most of the conferences do offer assistance. And like sometimes they will even give a lower registration fee for students and things of that nature. So it really is useful to attend conferences in the space that you're interested in and use that as a wonderful opportunity to network. I think that another thing, too, is just looking into what other organizations, so say for myself, I work with epilepsy, but there's local epilepsy foundations, and so you can even work with them, and they are more of an advocacy organization, but they still work with and have a lot of connections within industry, because a lot of times they will have partnerships with those industries and things like that, where if you are working with them, you can go, you can even volunteer, and you may run into some of the people that work from some of those different companies. Like I know I was just at a 5 a fundraiser and we had a big booth there and individuals still would have had that opportunity to come up and network with our company because we were there and had that presence. So even looking at nonprofit organizations that are within the space that you're interested in, because that still may help to drive some of that networking for you. And I don't know, Laura and Shreya, if you all have any specifics about certain organizations that you feel would be useful for individuals to look into. Um, I would look into uh, the, <clears throat> to get like the where you get the BCMS certification, like board certification in medical affairs, um, they have a large network. And uh, you know, if you're looking, you know, to medical affairs, that's, I think that's a good uh, certification to get to put on your, you know, CV. Definitely, there's also the Medical Science Liaison Society, which I, a lot of people are a part of, and you can network. And there's different workshops. I know one that I attended this year was really how, you know, how to deal with the pandemic and getting those meetings because that was very much a struggle over the last year. Um, so there's definitely organizations out there and to, to look to look into. Even just look locally, you might be able to find some things as Yvonne mentioned, advocacy groups are a great way, attending conferences, um, and even asking if you are shadowing any medical providers, or if you're doing any work at any of these labs, they might have some connections as well. Yes, and thank you all for that. And another thing that I know for me personally, I would love to be able to hear your thoughts on this as well, is trying to find mentors and utilizing those mentors. And wanted to see if either of you have any success with working with a mentor in regards to your professional journey, how that has worked out, and if you have any suggestions for other individuals about how to select a mentor and what types of things they should be utilizing that mentor for. I do not, but I definitely think that having a mentor will really um, help you kind of guide you know, guide your way into exactly what you may or may not even be looking for. So I'm still looking for my mentor, but um, I, I, I think for, you know, a lot of uh, people have reached out to me and on LinkedIn and asked, you know, Hey, how is the BCMS certification? Is, is it worth it? Is it, is it hard? You know, things like that. And I tried to guide them as to, you know, this is what you should do, or this is how I studied and things like that. And um, I tried to be helpful, but it's hard finding someone that will kind of show you the ropes, I feel like. I, I agree. It is can be very difficult to find a mentor. I had a mentor from medical school who was absolutely wonderful. And even though as I was changing journeys from practicing into this, he was very supportive with me. And I think that's important is to find those 
people in your life that will support you and help you throughout the different changes as you figure out what you like. So even if your mentor currently is not in the industry you want to be in, I think that's absolutely okay as long as they are there to support you and help you grow as an individual. You can always lean on them to ask them what are some things you they feel like you could improve on or what are things that are, you know, what do you excel at? So don't be afraid you know, worried if the person that is your mentor right now, or you're looking up to is not, you know, in the industry that you are currently trying to get into. I think any, all of us need mentors. And I kind of agree with Shrey. I'm still looking for, you know, some mentorship right now. And it, it can be very difficult to find. But when you find that person, it's great. It's a it's a great, valuable resource. Agreed. Yes. And I mean, there's always the need to continue to search for mentors. So definitely not an issue if you haven't found that mentor. I know for me, I still even rely very heavily on the mentor that I had back in high school. And like you said, Laura, she isn't even in the current space that I'm in, but she does work in human resources and human affairs. And so just even being able to reach out to her when I'm applying for different jobs, she's looked over my resume several times for me and things like that. Even though she's not in the exact space that I'm in, she's still been able to provide a lot of that valuable insight and really kind of that guidance that I needed at different points in my life. Even just having someone to just talk through different situations and different scenarios, just to try and determine, you know, am I thinking about this right? you see it from a different angle? Is there anything else you would suggest that I do or anyone else that you suggest that I would try and look to to find some additional information? So I do think that mentors are very important. I mean, and yes, you may reach out to some individuals and they may not respond or you might not hear back from them, but I would still encourage everyone to continue to just kind of send out messages, be on LinkedIn, even individuals that you may be taking a class from a certain professor that you feel like you have a good connection with, just really linking up with those individuals and seeing if they have some specific advice for you about where you may be along your journey. And now another thing I know, you know, we've talked a lot about what roles we have, kind of what it is that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. I know for me, kind of thinking about this space and thinking about what I wanted to do with my life. And it's not something that we typically talk about. So definitely if you all are uncomfortable, please feel free. I just wanted to get a better sense of as well. What are some of the salaries looking like? Let's, let's talk about money. What are the salaries looking like? I would say that in general, I know for like medical affairs and medical science liaisons, there are a couple of different companies that will give you kind of the general range of where people fall. And so I did look more recently and based on some of the current surveys, they are saying that for like intro medical science liaisons that the average is about $165,000 a year. And then on top of that, there are typically some additional perks that usually come along with that. Since it is a field-based role, a lot of times individuals will also be given either a car allowance or a company car. And then they do even give some other perks such as, you know, cell phones and things like that that kind of add on to what you get for that base salary and then potentially a yearly bonus as well on top of that. So just to give a general overview, but I don't know, Laura, Shreya, do you all have any thoughts in terms of like general salaries and kind of ranges that you've seen? Um, well, I feel like the longer you are in the field, you know, obviously um, your the number of years plays into how much you make. Um, so I feel like as long as, you know, you work towards that, I think a starting salary of 160 is amazing. Um, and then just, you know, moving up from there. So, you know, and I feel like that's and, and I, I feel like um, you do pretty well you know, in medical affairs. So. Yes, I, I agree. So at Biogen, we definitely um, have a lot of benefits here. So not just our salary, we have a very handsome salary range here at Biogen, especially with our bonuses, but we also have the car like Yvonne said. So I have a Volvo SUV from them that is fully taken care of by Biogen, which includes my insurance, my gas, and all my tolls, and that includes personal use as well. You are taxed on it, but that's all you pay for. We also have other benefits here as well. We have a nice 401k match. We have 
um, where you can buy stock, some stock options. We also have some other things here that are just really cool perks. We have something um, called big awards where if you know you can give them out and it's cash, it's true cash, and you can go onto this site and redeem them. I normally just get Amazon with it, Amazon gift cards, but it's great. I mean, so you know, I've given them out to some of my salespeople. I've gotten them. I mean, you can give from 50 bucks all the way to like $500 if the managers approve, but so not a lot of people getting the 500, but there's a lot of other perks and bonuses. We also have something called circles, which is a free concierge service to us as well. Um, so bonus or uh, salary is great, but when you are looking at these jobs, you want to look at the entire package as a whole, because there's a lot more than just your base salary when you are going into this industry. I will also want to add for Zimmer Biomet, we have a fantastic, um, you know, health insurance plan. So I look at that and especially with kids and dependents, it's just, you know, it's awesome. Um, so definitely look at the whole package when you're, you know, looking at where you want to work. Well, thank you, ladies. And so before we close out, I did just want to ask you all just really quick kind of any final words, final thoughts, or even if you have like one word of encouragement for anyone that's thinking about a career in medical affairs, what would that be? Uh, educate yourself, um, you know, figure out whether you really want to do this and then just, you know, set a goal and follow, follow the steps. I would say, don't give up, don't get discouraged. You know, it might not happen for you right away, but it will happen. So keep pushing, keep driving forward. You will get to where you want to be. And definitely Yvonne has helped me with, with that and, you know, those further goals and stuff. So don't get discouraged. Don't give up. Keep pushing. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the two of you all. I'm definitely very appreciative for you all joining us for the panel today and for all of the wonderful insight and advice that you have given. And with that, I will pass it back over to you, Kristen. Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you, Shreya and Laura. This was as fabulous as I hoped it could be. Thank you so much for your time. I, I was sitting back there nodding my head over and over and just so much great insight. So thank you so much for your time. Um, you guys mentioned try to attend conferences and Yvonne said there are often um, student aid or discounts available. So we will be presenting this panel at our summit next week, which is free to students. So feel free to pass that on to those in your network. And um, we also run a mentorship program. So I may be reaching out to you guys <laughs> to see if you'd be interested. It's, it's virtual so we can connect people across the country as well as the state. So you guys were awesome. Thank you so much for your time and information. It was absolutely wonderful. And I hope you have an excellent weekend. And this comes back around with everything you just put out to our attendees it, that I hope it comes back to you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Have a great one. Thanks.